Wow, wow, wow. So many good things happening in the season. Had a wonderful time on Wednesday evening, uh, midweek celebration, celebrating Daryl's 40th birthday. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, particularly the ice cream and chocolate sauce and all the extra other things that we had. Yeah, so good. And then we got to celebrate the four babies that had just been born in the last couple of weeks. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, so so much so much going on and just a delight for us to be able to do it as a family. And uh, yeah, we uh, also had the wonderful women's conference yesterday and by, uh, yeah, yay. So heard reports, obviously I wasn't there myself. Uh, but heard reports that it was absolutely outstanding, just uh, such an amazing time, and uh, so grateful to, to the Lord for that, and that that continues to, uh, to expand and to grow. And uh, you might have noticed that Lisa and I weren't here for the last couple of weeks, and that was because we were ministering to some other churches that are part of our network. So the network of churches is called Foundation Ministries International, and there are over 1,300 churches that are part of the network throughout the continent and uh, so we're not able to obviously get to all of them but we we try and get to some and so there were two churches here in South Africa that we we went to go and be part of and particularly as they were transitioning leadership from one generation to the next so that was super super exciting and uh, so it's just so good to see that the Lord is working powerfully in his church and that the kingdom is growing and expanding and we get to be a part of that so um just be encouraged in terms of what the lord's doing in this nation yeah and uh, so the the gospel is spreading and light is increasing the kingdom is coming Woo! so so good yay looking forward again to hosting tracy evans with us next weekend so that's going to be super good. And I know that a number of people will be away for the long weekend. But if you come in, just you know, catch it by nightfall, you'll be able to join us for a revival night. All right, so, uh, so see if you can, can join us for that. That's going to be heaps of fun. So that's next weekend, revival night uh, with Tracy Evans. Okay, so when I was sharing a couple of, well, three weeks ago really, uh, started out just with some reflections on this whole understanding of tithing and that actually one of the key things that we want to take note of is that it has to do with attitude. It's more about our hearts than about the actual cash or whatever it is. God is interested in us more than our stuff and so there's this test there's this wrestle that takes place within the body of Christ and one of the things as I've been reflecting over this um, you know why is it that there's this this uh, this wrestle amongst believers when it comes to this question of finances and you'll know that Jesus actually helped us with the answer to this because he said where your heart is, no, where your, ah, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So it's all about what do you treasure? So do we treasure things, money, or do we treasure God? Because our heart is meant to follow and go after what we treasure. So we sing songs and we say, you are my treasure. Yes. And he says, fantastic, I'm going to give you an opportunity to actually work that out. And so he said in, in Matthew 6, he said, you can't serve both God and mammon. You will love one, hate the other, be devoted to one, despise the other. So there's this rivalry for our worship, for our affection, what our hearts are going to go after. And so mammon is the ancient Aramaic name that was given to the, the, the false god, the deity, if you like, that would give people prosperity. 
So you would offer worship to mammon. There were temples for mammon. We still have them today. They're called shopping malls. And people willingly go and give sacrifices at, at, the, at mammon temples. Yeah? And um, so, so mammon actually doesn't want people to take money and use it to worship God. Mammon influences people and their hearts to go after money and so to be devoted to it so we become selfish instead of generous we 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 don't want to use money to worship God we want to use God to get more money and so there's this strange thing that's taking place in a, in the, the spiritual realm that impacts and influences our lives and our hearts and it causes people to have have this internal struggle and wrestle until they come to a knowledge of the truth and an understanding oh I'm not trying to serve mammon I'm trying to serve God and so I'm going to use everything at my disposal to defeat the works of the enemy and to in a sense take back what the enemy stolen whether it be affection or even things, the orientation of my heart, and I'm going to take stuff and I'm going to use that to exalt the Lord. So then it's settled. And I guess I'm preaching to the choir because you've all got that settled. All right, we can go home and have lunch then. Or would you like a little bit more background? Okay, let's do a little bit more background. Okay. So, last time we spoke about attitude and we were in uh, two particular passages. One was Deuteronomy chapter 14 and the other one was Numbers chapter 18. And we were pulling some principles there that it's about coming with rejoicing, that we should come and it would be an act of worship as we tithe. It's a part of consecration and giving ourselves and yielding ourselves to him. So it's devotion, it's worship. So tithe is about worship. So it's, it's dealing with our heart more than the actual amount of money that, we, that we're giving. He's, he's after our hearts. That we should bring it to the Lord. Don't just send it, but we bring it. And that we should plan, so it's, there's, there's intentionality in this thing, that we're considering our ways, we're considering what we're doing, and so we, we, um, we structure our affairs in such a way that we are taking care of this thing called tithing. It doesn't just happen. You know, you don't go to bed, you know, it's kind of like, oh my goodness, as I reflect on the last day, it's just like, man, tithe just happened. No. You plan and you bring your tithe. So there's, there's legs to this intention. We have to, from a place of desire and intention, there actually has to be action that implements it. And um, we, we noted the, the, the thing that we can anticipate receiving and walking in the blessings of the Lord because we're walking in his ways so there's a pattern of of living in the kingdom and as we do that we can expect and anticipate that we're walking and living in his favor so we're the blessed ones yeah and then also we noted just in passing this whole thing in terms of a wider application in terms of church and, and the way things operate, that the, the people brought the tithes to the Levites, the Levites to the priests, the priests to the high priest, and the high priest to God. And so there's this pattern of tithing outwards and upwards. And so we as a church, we tithe to the network, and the network tithes in uh, supporting ministries that are 
beyond us. So there's this whole principle. You don't, you know, you can't just tithe back into your own pocket because then it's circular. It doesn't work. It's like, yeah, I'm going to tithe to myself. Well, that doesn't work. All right. So we we, we noted that also from um, from Numbers 18. Okay. So one big takeaway for this morning. It's not complicated. Even yes. Okay. The one thing, tithes belong to God. Tithes belong to God. Because if we get this thing, this truth, if we get this thing settled in our hearts, then there's no more fight, there's no more struggle. Because if we think it's mine or if somebody is juking the system, whatever it is, then we don't want to act, we, we find ways to reason why we shouldn't or whatever it might be. But when we come to a realization of the truth that the tithe belongs to God, well then it's settled. It's his. And because he's God, he gets to determine what should happen with the tithe. I don't get to set the rules. He does. And so it's wonderful for us to be able to be looking at these truths that come from the scriptures because when we align ourselves with truth, the truth will set us free. So we want to walk in financial freedom. Well, that means then that we need to structure everything about our lives in um, a, a way in which they are congruent, they're aligned with the truth of scripture. And then we can expect what the Lord says he will do because we're in alignment with it. If we disjointed, then we can't be walking properly with him, and then we're not going to get where we need to be. But if we're in alignment, then we can anticipate that what the Lord said will happen, will happen. Okay. Fantastic. Would you turn with me then to Leviticus chapter 27? And I'm hoping that I can just show you a little bit um, deeper why the tithe actually belongs to God. So we're going to start a couple of verses ahead of where I want to go, but we need the context here. So in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 28, it says, but nothing that a person owns or, uh, and devotes to the Lord, whether it's a human being or an animal or family land, may be sold or redeemed, Everything so devoted is most holy to the Lord. Okay, let's just stay there. So if you devote something to the Lord, anything that's been devoted to him is most holy. And the, 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 the root word there in the Hebrew, this thing of being devoted to the Lord, it has the connotation that something has been given over irrevocably, completely even to the point of destruction you'll see it in your footnotes there in your bible and the the understanding was that when something was given to the lord in this particular way you couldn't take it back it could not be used for anything other than the the lord's purposes for worship and so then the lord says this is holy now what does the word holy mean and the reason that we need to just revisit this quickly is because often we confuse cause and effect. So cause, be holy. The fruit of that is purity. When people look at Christians and say, oh, you're a holy Joe. What are they doing? They're looking at your behavior, the fruit, the consequences, and they're describing you based on your behavior. So the effect, being, being righteous, living righteously. But we live righteously because he's made us right. So he makes us right, therefore we live right. He says, listen, you are mine. So we become his 
treasured possession. We belong to him. He says, be separated from the world's system. Not from the world because you live in the planet. But from the system of the world. The way the world operates and thinks, which is against God. So separate, don't think the way the world thinks. Be separate from it. Be holy. The word holy is to be separate from and devoted to God. So God is holy in that he's separate from his creation. He's totally different and totally other. So he says, be holy like I am holy. He's like, hey, we're separated from the world and we belong to him. So because we belong to him, he makes us righteous. He says, you're holy. And then as a result of that, we live righteously. We live out a holy life. And so the consequences or the cause of, sorry, the, yeah, the effect, because he's caused us to be holy, to be separated to him, devoted to him. So then the fruit of that is a life that pleases him. Okay? Now, this thing of being holy is to be separated unto, not, not to be a goody-goody. So to be separated. So the Lord says in Leviticus 27 and verse 28, everything so devoted is holy to the Lord. Verse 29 no person devoted to destruction may be ransomed. They are to be put to death. Okay, this is the whole thing of if somebody needs the death penalty because they've sinned, you can't redeem them. You can't suddenly say, hey, take the ox instead of the person. It doesn't work that way. All right, that's what that verse is trying to say. Verse 30, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord it is holy to the Lord. Wow. So now the tithe belongs to? Oh, I thought it was my tithe. I'm bringing my tithe. Sorry, whose tithe are you bringing? That would be the Lord's tithe. So we're bringing the Lord's tithe and we're bringing it to him because it's his. It belongs to him. So it's no big deal. He says, here we are. I'm going to give you more than enough. All right. So I'm going to give you extra and then you give back to me. And part of this is so that you've actually got something to give to me. Remember we spoke last time about my parents giving us money to, to be able to give. We didn't have the money. We weren't earning. But my father would give to us so that we had something to give. So the Lord gives to us so that we've got something to give. And he says, listen, I'm going to trust you as a good steward. Of the 100%, just give me back the 10, you can keep the 90. And then, you know, we've got all kinds of things going on around being a good and faithful steward with the 90 that you got rewards, eternal rewards. But that's a whole nother subject for another day. Maybe the finance course would be a great place to, to learn more about that. Okay, but he says the tithe, it belongs to the Lord. It's holy to the Lord. In other words, God says it's separate from the rest of your finance. Now in your mind, when you look at your bank account or your salary uh, deposit, whatever it is, you think like, hey, it's all just one amount. But the Lord is very clear. He knows what belongs to him. You know, he sees everything. He knows 100%. He knows 10%. You know, he's, he's pretty good at maths. 
So he can, he can easily see, he knows, okay, what's meant to be tithe, what's meant to be the rest, to be stewarded. What's, what is the portion that's holy and what is the portion that's common for everyday use? What needs to be separated out from and what's the rest just keep going? All right? So the tithe is holy to the Lord. Uh, verse 31, whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. It's like, you know, say for example, um, you, you, you had a wonderful crop of particular kind of fruit and you wanted to um, keep that and rather tithe more on something else. So if you wanted to switch things around, just no problem, just add another 20%. It's like, you know what, I'm not going to tithe this month because I'm going on holiday. I'll do a double tithe next month. Not a problem, just add 20%. Just a thought. Okay, don't worry about that one. Okay, um, verse 32. Every tithe of the herd and the flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. So, We've got, you know, things that are just growing in terms of crops, trees, plant life kind of thing, then animal life. And remember, in that kind of um, uh, existence, there, there weren't factories. There weren't office blocks. The way in which you would be able to get ahead would be to take things from the ground you, you, the increase would come. Your business was farming. This is like, you know, Garden of Eden stuff going on to the next level. And so as the Lord brings the increase, the, the Lord is the one who causes the crops to grow, causes the, the flocks to, uh, to increase, to multiply. And he's saying, listen, let's just bring a tenth of that, that it belongs to the Lord. And, and whatever comes under the rod, you know, just, uh, just send it along. Verse 33, no one, no one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. If anyone does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. So if, for example, the tenth sheep coming under the rod just wasn't, it was maimed and we want to give the best well take another one in a sense to redeem the maimed one as the tithe but actually give both it's pointing to the objective is not to give as little as possible the heart attitude is hey I want to give the best so I'm not trying to get out of this thing I'm actually recognizing and understanding that there's something about the favor of God that works when I live in an upside down way in this upside down world which in actual fact because it's a double negative causes me to be right side up did you get that it seems like we look like we're living upside down like I'm trying to give away as much as possible but because I'm trying to give away as much as possible which seems to be upside down in terms of this world system, but because this world system is itself upside down, it then causes me to be right side up. The world system is save, conserve, hold on self, self-preservation. Keep it. You can't trust anyone, don't give to anyone, it's yours. So it's everything is around self. In the kingdom, it's like, it's yours, Lord. Everything is yours. So, hey, the more that I actually put on your plate, the less I have to manage. And you're going to take care of me anyway. So this is win and win. Okay. So, that word for 
devoting to the Lord. Things that are devoted to the Lord, he says they're holy, they're to be separated out. Interestingly enough, that same root thing there for being devoted crops up when they go into the promised land. Because these instructions, as recorded in Leviticus, were given to God's people when they were still in the wilderness. And all they've got is manna. And so they got all these instructions and like, so what are we going to do with all this stuff? Not a problem. But then they go into the promised land and, and the Lord says, okay, here's what we're going to do. The first city you go to is going to be a city that's going to be devoted to me. It's going to be holy for me. So let's have a quick look in Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 15. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and they marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled around the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Verse 17, the city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. See the word there? Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies that we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and they must go into his treasury. So there was stuff that was to be spared, but it was in for the Lord. It was holy. It was devoted. So there were some things that were spared from the city of Jericho, but didn't go to the people, didn't go to the warriors who captured the city. The entire city and everything in it was holy to the Lord, devoted even to the point of destruction. So anything that, that, didn't, uh, that wasn't destroyed, he said these specific things, and there, where does it go? Interestingly enough, it goes to the treasury. Okay, then verse 20, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, and so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Uh, verse 21 says, they devoted the city to the Lord, and they destroyed with a sword everything, every living thing in it, men, women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. That sounded like hectic, all right? They... they release a shout the walls come down basically the city's destroyed and they go in and they wipe everything out okay except one guy decides this is too good uh, I want some of this for myself so we see the next chapter Joshua chapter 7 verse 1 but the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. One guy does something and the Lord's anger burns against the entire people. Um, what goes on in the next couple of verses is they go and they fight against a small little city called I or AI. <laughs> hey. Nothing new under the sun. Um, and so because it's a small city, they say, listen, just send 3,000 troops. We can sort them out. And they go and they get a snort club. Can you say that in church? Okay. They get beaten up by the small city and 36 of their soldiers get killed and they kind of like what is going on lord you promise us victory they tear their robes they put on ash they are wailing before the lord and they are having a big 
pity party and they're saying it would have been better if we'd stayed on the other side of the Jordan what were we thinking God you've okay big big pity party so God commiserates with them you'll see this in um, verse 10 okay and the Lord said to Joshua shut up stand up what are you doing on your face I mean God was not in, um, he wasn't dealing tenderly. In other words, the reason, there's, a, there's a reason why you guys are in the situation you're in. Okay? Verse 11. Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions that is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies they turn their backs and they run because they've been made liable to destruction I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction and uh, so then they they do the whole thing and they find out that it's Achan and they take Achan to the valley of Achor, which is the place, the valley of trouble. And that's called the valley of trouble because he brought trouble on the nation. And they sort it all out there. Tithe is devoted to the Lord. It's holy. Just like Jericho was a city that was devoted to the Lord. It's holy. It's separated from the other cities. Other cities they captured, they moved in and they would, were able to take and live in them. But Jericho, no, because it was holy to the Lord. Tithe, you might think it looks like every other city. You might think it looks like every other part of your bank balance. But it's not. The Lord looks at it differently and he said, hey, you're going, to bring a pro you're going to bring some issues into your life if you don't treat the tithe as holy. Okay? So, let's have a look quickly in, in I say quickly, but it might not be as quick as you hope. In Malachi 3, we'll get to this, this passage again in, in future. But basically the Lord's saying, hey, you guys, there's all kinds of trouble that's going on in your lives. And um, I'm holy. So there's links now. God's holy. The tithe is holy. Guys, you are not doing things right. Okay? So now you're under destruction. You say, like, whoa, what's going on here? You've withheld the tithe. You're robbing from me, like Achan. You're robbing from me. And that's why things are not going well. So it, you're under a curse. Okay? pause, relax, I'm going to address it in a moment. But he basically says to them, repent, change the way you think and the way you act, return to me and I will return to you. And then I'm going to open the windows of heaven and I'm going to pour out a blessing. All right. And then take a look at this in verse 11. I will pre prevent pests um, from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe. The tithe belongs to God as holy, devoted to destruction. That means that even if you don't give it to God, you still don't get to use it. God's not mocked. He knows what's going on. So it's his. It belongs to him. It's wholly devoted even to destruction. You keep it in your wallet. Fine, you can do that. 
but you're not going to get to use it. So there's this thing that goes on where pests devour your crops and the vines drop their fruit. Your business, your financial endeavors, your investments, your savings, all these things that you're doing actually, like what's going on here? Why are things being eroded? Why is it that we constantly at the doctors, even though we believe in healing, and we're forever buying medicine which costs an arm and a leg? Why is it that, you know, and we've all got our situations where things seem to just disappear. At the end of the month, we've got too much month and too little money. And we were hoping it was going to be the other way around. More money than, than there was month. And so the Lord's saying, hey, when you tithe, I'm going to stop this, this erosion that's taking place in your life. Because you're inviting that erosion into your life when the 10% that belongs to God, you think you're getting to use it? Actually, you're not. Is this making sense to you? Okay. Can I just say that as New Testament believers, we're under grace, we're not under law, and we're not under the curse anymore. So in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, if we can just pop there quickly, Galatians 3 and verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree, or in this NIV says a pole. Uh, verse 14, he redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abram might come to the Gentiles through Je Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So it's by faith, not by works. So the old covenant was law-based, rules-based, and your righteousness was because you kept the law, which no one could. Therefore, no one was righteous. But because Jesus came and fulfilled all the requirements of the law, he says, if you believe in him, you will be saved. And his righteousness then is given to us. So we are declared righteous. Not only that, but all the weight of judgment and punishment the penalty of sin and all the curses that came into the earth because of the fall of Adam and Eve all of that was placed on Jesus on the cross so the curse that should have come to us Jesus has taken it on himself we are no longer under a curse hallelujah that's amazing yay so we're not under law, we're under grace. We're not under the curse because the curse was if you obey my law, you'll be blessed. And if you break my law, you'll be cursed. So blessings and curses is legalistic based on the law. Now, all promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. It's just one constant stream of yes. And the curses have been removed. So our finances, if we don't tithe, we are not cursed. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Give him a high five. Man, that's the best news I've had all day. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, because if you've heard teaching that says, you know, if you don't tithe, you're going to be cursed. No, no, no. Let, let's not go there. That's Old Testament, Old Covenant thinking. We are New Testament, New Covenant believers. We relate to God on the basis of a new, superior, better covenant. Right? If you want to base yourself according to the old covenant, then you've got to keep every aspect of the old covenant. It's not a good deal. It doesn't work. No one besides Jesus ever made it work. So unless, yeah, no. Okay. So, so we relate on the basis of grace and faith. 
So we are not under a curse and our finances are not under a curse. And if I don't tithe, I'm not going to be cursed. Yay. All right. So I don't tithe out of fear. Because if I don't tithe, I'm going to be cursed. No, no, there's no curse. Yay, no curse. Yay. But the tithe is still not yours. The tithe belongs to God. So it's not about curse anymore. It's like, well, who does it belong to? It belongs to him. It's holy to the Lord. So even if you withhold it and you won't get a curse, you still don't get, don't get to use it. So there's no value in withholding. There is value in returning to him what's his. Some of our language isn't necessarily accurate. We say, I pay my tithes. No, no, no. I return my tithes. In fact, I return his tithe. Even more accurate. It's his, and we're returning to him. It's not my tithes. It belongs to him. I'm not paying. I'm returning. It just helps us just to shift some of our understanding of what's going on in our hearts and our minds and our lives. And so there's beautiful fruit consequences when we do things God's way, then like the the leakage, the spillage, like the, the cracks and the holes seem to just get filled up. Yay. And uh, so we can align ourselves with God's ways. And we can experience so much favor and joy because we're not living with constant disappointment. So if you withhold it, thinking that you're going to, like, where did it go? It's like, what happened? Oh, you know, another pothole and had to replace another tire. I'm, I'm not blaming potholes and everything on your lack of tithing. But I'm just saying, somehow, these kinds of things, the pests that devour, devour deals that just don't come through, you, you, you're expecting to come to harvest and it just doesn't materialize. Okay? So the Lord, the Lord wants to release favor and goodness and blessing in our lives. Of course he does. He's a good father. He's not a mean father. He's not grumpy. He's not angry. He loves us. He loves his kids. And so our response is not because we, we, we're scared of his shambok. Our response is, how can we live in a way that pleases him? Because when we live in a way that pleases him, we live in his favor. Yeah? Okay. I think that's probably enough for now. What do you think? Yeah. I think so. So what was the one thing we were going to remember? Tithe belongs to God. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. If we get that thing settled, it takes the wrestle out of this thing. You know, like, should I, shouldn't I? Should I, shouldn't I? Uh, you know, is, is, is there some strange and ulterior motive for the church wanting to teach and preach this you know can i can i trust what it's like no it's don't worry about any of those things we'll get to that next time it's settled lord it's yours and you can take care of it so i do what i can do and i'll leave up to you what is yours your end of the bargain. All right, let's stand. Can we pray that we would walk in this open heaven environment of his blessing and favor coming upon us and that we wouldn't experience the disappointment of things just like falling through our fingers how's that yeah lord we thank you for revelation from your word that 
that shows us the way in which we should love you and honor you and worship you with every part of our being and all of the things that you've entrusted to us. You've given us a voice, we lift our voice in song. You've given us a body and we dance and we clap before you. you you've, you've given us a mind and we worship you with our thoughts and our thinking and our meditation. You've given us emotions and we, and we use those to love you. And you've given us the ability to receive income. And we use that to worship you as well. So help us, Lord, to settle these strange arguments that we would not be enticed through the ways of mammon, but that we should wholeheartedly serve you, follow you, that we might experience the goodness of God in the land of the living. Yeah. So thank you, Lord, for peace in our hearts. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your watchful care over us. Thank you that you do rebuke the devourer, that you do keep pests and pestilence and all these different things far from us. Thank you, Lord, for health and strength and energy, vitality. We thank you that you boost our immune systems, that we can overcome whatever ailments are doing the rounds we don't have to come under it, we can rise above it. Yeah. We thank you, Lord, for protection over our families and over our properties and over our possessions that we steward them well for your name and for your sake. So may our hearts be filled with peace. May joy carry us through all the days of our lives. We ask these things in the name which is above every other name. Amen. Amen, amen. amen.